welcome back everybody to another episode of the nonprofit show. I'm really excited that you are here because two of my favorite words are being bandied about today with our guest, Stuart Severino, disciplined innovation. And we're going to be talking about that with Stuart and with our great friend and co-host, Tony Bell, Mr. Nonprofit Consultancy. Hey, Stuart, welcome. You ready to rock and roll with us? I'm excited. Excellent. You know, we talk about this so much, Stuart, about growth and sustainability and being on track and all these things. And then how can we be innovative? And it's really frightening for a lot of nonprofits. So I can't wait to get into this conversation with you mm -hmm. um, so we can learn and, and maybe take a deep breath and move forward and be successful. We are also very successful at the um, nonprofit show because we have these amazing co-hosts. I'm Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. Been joined today, Tony Bell, Mr. Nonprofit Consultancy. Hey, welcome, Tony. No, thank you, Julia. I'm super excited about today's topic as well. And as you were saying, I, I love the word innovation, but I think even more challenging is the word discipline. Well, I know. It's really true. It's really true. And um, it, it's such a loaded word. And so I can't wait to know, to learn how we can navigate it. Um, you know, another thing that's really important at the nonprofit show are our amazing presenting sponsors. They include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Your Part-Time Controller, Fundraisers Friday, a new episode on Fridays that I'm working with Tony on really exciting, just dedicated to the, the hot topic of fundraising, and then 180 Management Group. These are the folks that support us day in and day out. Okay, Stuart Severino, Head of Innovation. Wow, that's a big title, my friend. <laughs> you know, it's just smoke and mirrors. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's the secret behind innovation? <laughs> yeah, you know, little bibbity bobbity boo, and it's all good. No, I'm kidding. Oh my okay. gosh. <laughs> yeah, that's hilarious. I love it. Tell us where you're joining us um, from today and talk to us about your work as a head of the head of innovation. Sure. I'm in the Woodlands, Texas. That's just north of Houston. Uh, the head of innovation is um, geared toward the navigators, it's a global discipleship ministry. It's been around since 1933, so it's a legacy uh, ministry, nonprofit. And so I have the distinct pleasure as uh, serving as the head of innovation, which helps move people through discipleship journeys to help them become disciple makers uh, throughout the U.S. and, and abroad. Wow. Amazing. Um, any organization that has traversed the decades of our country. Um, wow, that's that's truly amazing. Yeah, that's a tremendous legacy. So I'm really thankful to be there. Yeah, awesome. You know, when we talk about innovation, um, I'm. it's such a, like I said, a, a big word, a big concept. I mean, Tony, I think a lot of times we don't even understand really what it means or it means different things to everybody. But let's start, Stuart, with you. How are we doing as a sector in the nonprofit sector? Just to put an umbrella over it, what are you seeing? Yeah, it's interesting. I spent the last 25 years in the for-profit sector, startups, corporate turnarounds. And so coming into the nonprofit sector, it's really not all that different. And I'm so thankful to be partnered up with different innovation experts and I see the discipline actions that they take. So that's very that's really encouraging. Uh, but as in terms of the whole, what I'm seeing from, from my viewpoint is that uh, the nonprofit sector is currently grappling with inefficiencies and a scarcity mindset. That is really big, uh, scarcity mindset in the industry. That, that really just, it limits their potential, their potential impact in being resourceful and having that impact that they set out to, to have in their mission statements. I, I think what you said there, Stuart, is really important because also based on my experience, historically, nonprofits are not risk takers. And when you think of innovation, you think of the need to be able to take risks in order to test innovation or you know, to, to open up the doors to explore uh, new things in, you know, in technology or innovation. 
Uh, so I think what you said around a scarcity mindset is really important for our viewers and listeners to uh, to to hear. Yeah, that's a good point because the excuse or the answer typically is we don't have enough resources to execute X, Y, Z. And so that holds them back. And so understanding efficiencies at scale is so critical for a nonprofit to get into their DNA. Do you think that this is a habit that we have? That we just immediately say no, we don't have the funds, we don't have the resources, we don't have the broadband, whatever word that you want to use, it seems like there's a new buzzword that basically oh. is a sexy way to say no. Yeah, I think that's a symptom of something much deeper, and that flies at the leadership level. Many leaders fly under the radar and come in and and run a department or, or an organization as a whole, and they tend to lean on consultants. No offense, we're all consultants here to some degree, right? Um, but there's a quick move when that leader is in a, insufficient in a certain skill set or a certain discipline. And so when they're met with a challenge that they're not familiar with, they quickly move outside of that, which is why we play those roles as consultants. But mm. maybe they lean too heavily on that as their savior and they forget to integrate that consultant into the whole organization. And that's where the organization says, whoa, wait a minute, who is this new person coming in here rocking the boat, right? I Don't disturb what I'm doing. Don't add to my plate. So it's something much deeper, I think, is what I'm seeing. And wow. Stuart, I'm curious too, based on your experience, do you find it different based on the size of the organization? Are you mm -hmm. finding that small, smaller nonprofits tend to lean into wanting to explore innovation more so than medium and large, I mean, despite the scarcity mindset. I'm just curious if, if you see a difference based on the size of the organization. Great question. There, yeah, there definitely is uh, a difference between small and large. The small, yes, they're much more nimble. They're much more flexible. They can do much more at a quicker rate. The problem, there's still a common denominator though, and that is what innovation is perceived to be in their environment. So let's dig into that then, because we got to ask the question and have the discussion, what innovation is not, right? Like, again, it's it's a, a loaded question for you. Help us understand. Yeah. So over these last couple decades, uh, what innovation has been communicated to be is, hey, let's get together. Let's brainstorm. Let's come up with new ideas. Let's think outside the box. We're so yeah. familiar with that kind of terminology. Yeah. And so that is a really dangerous place to be because when it comes to disciplined innovation, that old mindset of throwing things against the wall to see what sticks cannot be part of your organization. Nonprofits can't afford, they cannot sustain to try, right? We, You hear iteration, you hear the words iterate, 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 tweak, make better. Those are real, but you can't use your resources and jump right to the middle of the process and start executing. You're gonna spend a lot of your resources. And so, you know, we have to get away from uh, thinking that innovation is something like, you know, the big ideas and throwing things against the wall, especially for donor supported organizations. You cannot sustain throwing things against the wall and seeing what sticks. It's just, it's not a good financial stewardship move. What about the idea though of how we are changing as a culture, um, things that we used to believe were caused one way, maybe they, they have a different background, um, the way we look at our own society and the levels of society. I mean, I feel like in my lifetime, in the last 15 years, 20 years, there's just been this uh, amazing change of how we perceive ourselves, our roles in our lives, in our roles in society, and frankly, our roles in philanthropic activity. So how do we do all this um, and not embrace being innovative, if nothing else, in our own attitudes? Does yeah. that sound like super crazy? That I <laughs> <laughs> no, you bring up a good point. People will hear what I'm saying and say, well, you're you're missing a whole component of what innovation is. And it is that freedom to be able to think differently. There is that in the process, right? I'm not saying there's not, but in an organization that is structured that has 
that has a, a, a finite amount of resources, they're in a really tight bind as to how they're going to steward those resources. So outside of that, innovation is, you know, the free thinking, thinking outside the box, being creative. How do I do this in my life uh, as a leader? But within the confines of something so structured, so challenging, uh, we have to think about innovation in terms of a process versus big ideas or brainstorming. Mm -hmm. I love that you use the word process. I mean, Tony, you're, mm -hmm. you and I are both like bobbleheads or like, uh-huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we talk so much in a lot of the episodes of the nonprofit show about how process supports uh, success. And, uh, and so, yes, I'm not surprised to hear, <laughs> to hear mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great point. Most miss that critical component of uh, work process. There's this, there's this whole sector of um, uh, work blueprint. And mm -hmm. so, understanding how an organization develops process, most kind of skim over that. When I ask uh, a, a, a leader, hey, show me your process for your call center, and they'll show me a list of bulleted items. I'm like, that's not a process. That's just a mm -hmm. list of bulleted items of what to do. <laughs> the, the work process is really the painstaking work of sitting down with your team and doing those flow charts, the boxes, the arrows, the decision right. points, and really thinking through and scrutinizing every decision. What happens if this happens? If then, right? Those if then statements. Once you devise that big elaborate process map, now you can build your checklist of what to do. I learned this from being on the engineering side where they were so methodical about their process, right? Working for uh, organizations that are deemed high reliability, HROs. HROs are commercial airliners, uh, oil and gas, hospitals. How do you function at such a high level every day without fatalities or minimization of injuries, right? De-risking. And those are things marketers, innovation experts don't, they're so boring. And so we don't pull the, we don't pull those into our DNA or structure. But man, when you when you implement those, they're powerful. And, and what you said was so important to me also, because I think selling the value of the end result mm. helps mm -hmm. so much because a lot of what you said already scares a lot of leaders of nonprofits like, oh, my gosh, this process and I got to be with everybody. And, you know, and they all automatically, Julia, like you said, start thinking about bandwidth and and the struggle of, you know, all these different priorities. So mm -hmm. uh, it's just you have to do the work. Uh, and a lot of times getting folks mm -hmm. to understand the value of the end result up front kind of helps them, you know, in that initial, you know, desire to want to invest in the way that that investment needs to be made. Right. Exactly. Well, and exactly. I think too, you know, and we have such a crisis mentality in the nonprofit sector. And for a lot of our, our, our members within our sector, yeah, we are, we deal with crisis, right? Um, but when you're in the middle of a crisis and just it's continual, it does not lend to being disciplined necessarily about thinking about these things. And so, Stuart, I'd love to before we move on to have you reflect on that a little bit, because if you're running a human services shelter or campus mm. or, or something like that, people can die. It mm. is it mm -hmm. is that highest level of stress and function how mm -hmm. do you pull back i don't maybe that's not even the right word but but how do you find that strength to define what your discipline is and then to pursue it what does that look mm -hmm. like that's a great question and i think that's where most struggle uh in in the case of running the shelter it typically starts with your risk management team, if you even have one, because their job is to identify those breaking points and those, you know, yeah. how are we, you know, what happens and, and uh, what are the potentials of being sued, right? And right. sometimes as nonprofits, you're forced, you're thrusted into coming up with innovative ways to protect yourself against that. Mm -hmm. But leadership has to take a step back and and someone on that leadership team has to be that risk adverse individual and and asking those hard questions that have never been asked before yes it's going to rock the boat but as an organization how are we going to minimize our risk 
And what does that even look like? Is there a metric for that? Do we have that <laughs> set? Is that part of our mission statement? I mean, is that is yeah. in our governance team, right? These yeah. are all difficult questions you have to think through, but sometimes it does take somebody outside of the organization to help you with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's really an interesting thing. Let's move on to this next topic. And I'm really fascinated. And Tony, I know you had some great comments in the green room about this as well. Consensus on the customer need is critical. Okay, explain that to me. And what does that look like? Yeah. So, so often product teams, services teams begin with a good idea, the product, the service. I think there was a Harvard study back in 2018 where it said that 80% of product teams of launches fail because they did not understand the core need, not a felt need, this is not marketing exercise, the yeah. core need of an individual. And so every day, here's how I indoctrinate everybody. Every day, you and I have tasks that need to be completed. We have jobs that we need to be completed. And so uh, we will hire and fire services, products, apps, people, in order to accomplish that task. If my wife says to me, Stuart, I need you to get dinner going. I'm like, babe, I have back-to-back -back Zoom meetings, impossible. She's like, well, I got this going on. You better go get dinner started. So I run over to Whole Foods and hire a rotisserie chicken in order to accomplish that job, right? And so part of innovation, part of innovation is to meet the desired outcome of that individual. How are you gonna satisfy that core need of that individual? Now, the product teams, the leadership, whatever it is, they all have to have consensus around the core need. Do we all agree that Stuart needs to get dinner done for his family today, right? If all are in agreement, which is really rare, if you go surprise a product team or a leadership team and ask them and survey them individually and say, what do you believe to be the core need for your audience? I guarantee you they're all going to have a different answer. And that's problematic, wow. especially if it makes it all the way to the product team. They have no idea what they're really developing. Everybody has great tech. Everybody has great services, those good ideas. But have we held to the letter of the law that dictates to us what the core need of that individual is? That is so hard to do, yet so basic, mm -hmm. so basic, and we miss it. So that's consensus. Tony, you had... What are your thoughts on this? Because I think this is a really big thing that we miss in the nonprofit sector. Well, everything that Stuart said was 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 so articulate and and spot on. Uh, and consensus is not an easy thing, <laughs> uh, regardless of 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 the topic. Uh, but when you know, so in the green room when we were chatting a little bit about this topic, uh, I was again just kind of leaning into my experience and thinking a, a lot of times nonprofits don't really. I, let me just say businesses, <laughs> uh, anyone providing a product or service, <laughs> a lot of times they don't know who the customer is. Uh, mm -hmm. So first you have to kind of define what is the customer. Mm -hmm. uh, and then again, just, you know, we have internal customers and external customers and, you know, mm -hmm. making sure that we understand the difference between those two. Uh, so that was really just, you know, the only thing that I've, I initially thought about just based on some of the work that I've done and how, we have these conversations about products and uh, and I learned pretty quickly that we had to first understand how we defined customer and what that really meant so that we were all starting with the same definition of mm. customer. Yeah. 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 It's interesting because we do jump to personas. We do jump to research mm -hmm. and segments. And so what I will caution the marketing teams, the research teams is, hey, let's identify a core need or a job that needs to get done. If anybody understands jobs to be done framework that started back in the mid nineties, uh, that is used to identify that need because here, here's why you can have personas and segments and research, but you may cut out an entire market. If you have only focused, let's say on an affluent crowd, I'll give you a quick example. Uh, if I'm producing marriage resources and my persona is, affluent male, female, ages 45 to, to 58 uh, in these specific regions, well, I just cut out an entire market who are mid-level or even uh, on, on a less affluent scale who are the same age range because what's the common need? What's the common core between all of them? 
what it's conflict resolution. I need a resource in marriage that will help me regardless of my status in society to, to help me accomplish what I need to do in my marriage. And that's to make a better marriage, to have better conflict resolution. And so when, when marketing teams focus too much on personas and segments in that research, we tend to leave out a really broad audience. So mm -hmm. from the nonprofit sector, I wouldn't say that in the for-profit sector because we're going after the dollars, right? But in a nonprofit sector, when we're looking to impact society, that's, that's, we really need to consider what is that core need. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and I, I, I feel like there's a, I mean, this could get into, you know, the conversation of saviorism and all that, you know, how we, how mm -hmm. we perceive somebody that we think needs a certain type of service or a certain mm -hmm. type of action in order to be successful or happy or, you know, resolve what we've defined their problem to be. Mm -hmm. You know, and again, that's that's for another show. But yeah. you know where I'm, where I'm going with this is that um, bottom line, I think, Tony, what you said is spot on. Shockingly, we don't do enough work to determine who our clients and our customers are. It, it's just it's it's really I think if you held up a mirror to most organizations, 1.8 million nonprofits registered in this country, you know, I bet there are probably less than 20% of our nonprofits that could actually define and really have a concise and clear picture of who they are serving and why they are serving. Um, and it changes, it changes, you know? And so, I mean, there, it's, a, it's a big, big question. I want to move on to one of our last topics with you, and that's thinking holistically in terms of operations. And I'm really interested in this because I feel like we're getting a lot of operations departments and they're like over there in that other building, right? <laughs> they're not part of everything. And right. is that just me seeing that or are you gentlemen seeing that? No, you're right. It's, it's the siloed effect within organizations. We all have our mandates. We have our OKRs. We have what we need to accomplish. Basically, you have your own agenda and yeah. you don't want any more added to your plate because you have a team to run. You have an, an impact that needs to be distributed through the organization. So nobody wants to cross the aisle and talk to an IT team or technology team or the marketing team, the communications team. And so we continue to run in our in our own lanes. And that's just part of human nature because we only have so many hours in a day. But that's why it's so critical to have an innovation expert or someone who is a facilitator that can transcend those different departments and ask the right questions of each department and figure out how you move together in this mission. That's really hard to do and takes a lot of patience, a lot of empathy, a lot of trust building within the, you know, for the leaders of, the, of, of each department within that organization. So I'll, I'll kick it off like that. <laughs> it's true. I mean, Tony, what do you think about this? Like, how do you see this? Well, I, for some reason, sir, when you said trust and empathy, I immediately went back to the word or went back to thinking about consensus building mm -hmm. and how trust and empathy play huge roles uh, in building, you know, consensus amongst, you know, amongst our team. So uh, that's where my mind drifted when the minute I heard those two words was I went back to consensus building because uh, that was still on my mind from the last slide and just, you know, some of the challenges around, you know, building that sometimes. You know, that's, wow. oh, sorry, Julie, are you going to say something? No, I, no, I'm, I, I agree. I, you don't, to me, it doesn't seem like you, you use that vocabulary with operations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, I will give you something tangible that, that the audience can use with regarding consensus, because that is so critical. If it doesn't happen at the leadership level, it's never going to trickle down. And so it, it, part of the research and in, in finding out the core need is a statement. What is your what you call a jobs statement? And the job statement is made up of something really basic. Uh, a verb, an object, and a clarifying statement. And so mm -hmm. when you when your team can agree on the verb, object, and clarifying statement, you now have the beginning of a framework that meets consensus among that team. I'll give you one that's that's ministry based, that's biblically based. Uh, Jesus said it, make disciples of all nations. Verb, object, clarifying statement. 
what that does is sets your true north. He means, I don't care what you call yourself, whether you're navigators or crew or, or whatever ministry, I don't care how you do it, whatever tools you use. What I'm saying is make disciples of all nations. That is the vision mission that will drive the products, the services, the boots on the ground, the operations. So if there's something tangible to take away here and to provide a framework for those who want to start implementing, it is that it is that job statement, verb, object, clarifying statement that gives clarity and consensus to the group. Yeah, I love it. I think that's a, a fascinating thing. A lot of times we get so enamored with uh, wordsmithing and building these really yeah. uh, flowery, you know, proclamations, if you will. No one can remember them. No one can recite them. Mm. And then it just kind of languishes a little bit. Um, it kind of goes back to your your concept of discipline and how we we're, we're framing this. In the time that we have left, can you talk to us about what some tools are for navigating discipline? Like, what is it that you advise us to do? Like, how do we keep rowing in the same direction? Mm. I would begin with asking, again, not to beat a dead horse, but do we have consensus on what the need is for that audience, consumer? person, whatever it is, do we have consensus on their specific need? There may be varying needs, but there's always a core need. And so you begin with that type of structure. So the first phase would be your research phase. We need to walk away with a jobs statement. Do we all agree? Do we have consensus? So what I just said earlier, there's a framework for that. That's step one. How do you begin with that, right? Uh, once you have that, now you move into the ideation, the brainstorming, coming up with the products and services. Too often we're met with the products or the services are developed first, and then we're trying to retrofit them and say, why, do, why, why is adoption so low and why is defection so high? And so, um, you know, that's problematic in every organization. But when you begin with that discipline, that pro it's a process. It's just a process. Mm -hmm. Nobody likes to think of innovation as a process because it makes it dry and boring. Mm -hmm. But but in nonprofits, boy, does that really help with efficiency and scale. So step one is the research, identify the core need. Step two, now take that core need, make sure everybody understands it and they check themselves. They check their ideas, they check their services and products and technologies against that core statement. Does what I'm about to do fulfill the need of that audience, right? You're always checking yourself. So you're in that product development stage. Again, this is really super high level because of timing. But and then step mm -hmm. three is that MVP or the or, or the proof of concept stage where you build out that platform, that service, that product, and you start now you start testing it. But you're testing it assured that you are addressing the core need. It's not me throwing something out there and seeing what the adoption rate, right? Marketing mm -hmm. tends to do that, especially when they do media buys. We want to get away from yeah. big media buys because they're they're just eating up our budgets. You're grabbing cold audiences and hoping to warm them up. There are mm -hmm. solutions around that, right? We cannot afford mm -hmm. to sustain those big ad budgets with, with ad agencies. And so we can do things differently. So that simple process of the research, the building based off of the research, and then moving into actual development and launch. Um, again, super high level, but there is a disciplined approach to how you do it. You stick to that framework and you're going to be okay. I promise you. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And, and Stuart, you even, you even said at the top of the show that you may need consultants or external resources to help do this. And, sure. and a lot of times consensus building requires an external facilitator or someone to help guide the conversation uh, to get you to that place of consensus. So I just want to kind of reiterate yeah. what you had said pretty much at the top of the show yeah. uh, that, you know, a lot of times you need these outside resources to really get you, get you there. You do. You do. You take someone as a, who, who has a diverse set of experiences from different verticals, you bring that and apply it to the nonprofit sector, you're going to get a different mindset. And so that consultant, mm -hmm. that mediator, you know, has to come with that skill set who also knows how to invite the staff into, into an effort that's going to be holistic, right? Because so often I see the CEOs get, get distracted by the shiny object of, <laughs> of a consultant coming in, right? And, and, and really selling them on some really great services. And so the CEO is like, yeah, that's a solution we need. 
All right. the while, their staff who has been working really hard on different projects, they're kind of left by the wayside. And that consultant forgets to interact with them. With them. A lot more work, right? But that's, yeah. you know, that that's the key, I think, to a successful uh, holistic environment. Wow. So. Stuart Severino, um, head of innovation, really been great to have you on to talk about these things. I also feel, Stuart, like this is the time of the year where a lot of us can actually even start to think about this because once the fall hits, we're mm. just all so incredibly busy that a lot of yeah. these concepts and discussions um, go out the way. And so I really appreciate you joining us today on the nonprofit show. Tony Bell, once again, you are a delight and I love your perspective. Tony Bell, Mr. Nonprofit Consultancy, joining us here is one of our intrepid co-hosts. Another amazing group that joins us day in and day out. Those are our presenting sponsors and they include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, your part-time controller, Fundraisers Friday, a new episode every Friday that Tony and I work on, and 180 Management Group. These are the folks that are with us day in and day out so we can bring you the voices of Stuart Severino, um, Head of Innovation. Really been a lot of fun. Thank you yeah, so much. Thank you. Thank you, Julia thank and Tony. You, this was great. Hey, it's really been a joy to, to have this conversation. You really got me thinking about a lot of things. And at every end, at the end of every episode, we leave with this and it means something different to me. I hear it differently today. Mm. And it goes like this to stay well so you can do well. Thank you, gentlemen. We'll see you.